could you introduce yourself for the audience, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Alex Foltz. Uh, I am an oil painter, uh, primarily a portrait painter, um, working out of the United States. And I've been, shoot, I've been doing art uh, as long as I can remember. Um, I started oil painting about 10 years ago, and I've been doing it full time as a profession for maybe two and a half years now. Okay. Well, you've got very classical approach to your drawing and painting, which is beautiful. I, I, I mean, I'm a big advocate of the, you know, fundamentals. So you. what's your uh, upbringing in art? What's your training and your education there? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have any formal education. Um, I, uh, you know, I think it's just something that I took an interest in very young. Um and and back then it was it was really just like oh you know this is my favorite uh, cartoon character, um, so I'm gonna draw them or I'm gonna you know draw some weird monster that I've created in my head. And um, when I was, I want to say when I was about eight years old, uh, my mother met my stepdad. He uh, also doesn't have any formal training, but he's an artist as well. He did a lot of sculpture and woodwork. Um, and he showed me a lot of fundamentals on like the proportions of a face and how to um, sort of approach that more accurately. And I think it sort of launched from there, you know? Um, so I got into trying to do more realistic portraits from that point. And um, it's really been, it's really just been a lot of independent study, a lot of trial and, and a lot of failure, I think that's gotten me to, to where I'm at now. Um, but of course, there's, there's resources that I've used that have been incredibly helpful. Of, you know, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to have access to like YouTube videos and things um, during my earlier development uh in my art and so you know not to say that there isn't any influence um but there is no formal training it, it it really has just been kind of a lot of uh studying the work that i love the most and looking at it very closely and trying to sort of puzzle together how that artist constructed it and um see if i could figure out how to do that myself mm, fantastic well aside from the classical portraits and, and pet portraits you have retained your love of the the kind of characters and the, the kind of youthful side of that art making which is lovely and it's really creative so was that a decision that you had to make where you thought this is a, a specific path I'm taking as an artist or was that just uh, something you didn't want to compromise how did that come about mm. I, I think that's something I've, I've struggled with for a while actually is like you know, I think uh, every great artist has their niche, you know, um, and uh, and I think when I when I really dove into the portrait work, I thought, you know, man, this really could be for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I still love it to death. But but I do think that, you know, everybody has that their own thing inside of them that wants to come out, you know, and and, and for me, it can't all come out in the portrait. So um, a lot of it does you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, bar myself off from the opportunity to explore those, you know, weird subconscious things um, in my art, because, you know, that's like the, the best outlet I have to, to speak to people about what goes on in my head, you know? Mm. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, cause there's the characters, which I love as well, because it's, things which people can relate to immediately ident identify and it's great for social media so that people can, you know, hopefully see some of your work and it will make it mm. stand out. But then there's also, you do fantasy artwork, which I, do. I don't know how much of that is invention and how much is using reference. None of it detracts whether it is or isn't with, you know, if you say, oh, there's a lot of reference from other artists or from locations, I don't think that detracts at all. It's all just interesting, but it could just be invention. And I'm not sure how you, conjure these scenes where, where does that come from um <laughs> i don't i don't know how much <laughs> i don't know how much you're you're willing to talk about on the podcast specifically um i had um 
I had an experience in in 2017 that that was very um I think uh you know incredibly impactful for me and it 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 really kind of changed the way that I looked at the world um and the way that I look at myself and um there's been this urge to find a way to translate that into paintings and I think a lot of my sort of outlandish or or fantasy works um at least part of me is sort of tapping into that um you know I a, a, a lot of that strange work that I do is is tied to this sort of like cycle of of life and death and so, you know how everything is interconnected you know plants and animals and people are are all made of the same stuff and and coming from you know the same things and so i like to sort of play with those ideas and mesh those things together um so a lot of that is coming from you know in my head i guess um i do use reference for sure for pretty much everything i do um i just find that uh most images if you want them to like feel grounded and real that that working from some form of reference is is a really helpful way to do that um so if it if it's not something that i set up in my studio specifically to refer to then um recently i've actually been using uh, ai generative tools oh, wow. um which i know a lot of artists who are very scared of <laughs> of that and i i am too um but the it, it's interesting um the sort of outlandish things that you can get those tools to generate in a really convincing way especially when it comes to like light and shadow mm. um it seems like those tools just understand that so perfectly um so you know if there's something that i absolutely cannot set up in my studio to use as a reference um i do sometimes uh, use those tools to to kind of give me a launching point um mm. never never a one-to-one -one translation i think that kind of takes something away from the art to 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 do it that way but at least something to refer to yeah yeah well i think there's a skill in taking photo reference whether it's a, an image that you've taken or not, to kind of use it in a way that is creative as a skill, which people I think should learn well, because obviously if you're doing a one-to-one -one comparison, it kind of detracts from the ability to inject your own personality and voice into it. But I'm sure. just, I mean, this, this podcast is open to whatever you're willing to share. And I'm very curious now. I mean, if it's not, if it's too personal, feel free to avoid it, but otherwise, uh, what you mentioned in 2017, I'm curious what the event was that was this catalyst for this uh, point in your life. Um, yeah, I'm not opposed to talking about it. Um, so uh, in 2017, let's see, uh, I had a group of friends that were very... <laughs> uh exploration driven you know they wanted to explore everything from the woods to you know the their their selves and everything else and um uh at, at that point i didn't have much experience with like mind altering substances um but uh i had a friend who suggested that we try like psilocybin mushrooms um and i thought at first I said, no, uh, I've always been kind of averse to, to substances in general. Um, but you know, I did some research and I found out that it was like non-addictive and all this other stuff. So I said, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, it felt like it, it was giving me some sort of, uh, peek into something, you know? Um, and at first I thought it was giving me a, a, like a peek behind the veil of like the universe or life or whatever. <laughs> um, and, and now I really think it, it, it sort of, it more was revealing like what's going on inside of my own head, you know, how my thought processes are made. I, I'm, I'm really, I have a really heavy interest into, um, you know, science and, and, um, 
you know, the universe and the brain, the mind really fascinates me. And uh, I think, you know, when you, when you're having an experience that's, that's induced by, by hallucinogenic, um, it's just kind of scrambling the, the pathways in your head. And I think it was giving me this sort of, it was lifting the veil of like how my thoughts are made and how my brain operates. Um, and that was incredibly impactful for me. Um, and I had a particular experience in 2017 um, that was uh, very bad. Um, <laughs> it was, it was a, a psilocybin, you know, hallucinogenic experience and it was very bad. Um, I have since sworn off of the stuff, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it really shocked me. I think about six months after that, um, I just didn't really feel like I was present or like uh, anything was real or that it mattered. Um, but I did feel this really deep uh, interconnectedness with everything, especially nature. I would just go out into the woods for, you know, hours on end by myself and just enjoy the company of the trees. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that stuck with me really, really well, you know, and even though it was a bad experience, I, I, I wouldn't take it back and I don't regret it because um, I, I feel like I have a deeper understanding of myself as a person and my place in the, grand scheme of things um maybe not on a social level but but on a like physical and biological level mm. if that makes any sense and it does i mean i'm not <laughs> without experience myself so i can relate to what you're saying was it um was it a dosage issue was there just too many um yeah i don't know if you had it as a broth or if you had it as a tea or if you ate it and then yeah uh I think it was definitely, it was a dosage issue and it was, um, you know, at the time, I think uh, we, we had mixed some other substances in that may, maybe shouldn't have been mixed in. Mm. Um, but it was definitely a dosage issue. I mean, um, before that, it had always been moderate or, or small doses and it always felt like, uh, you know, I was getting a glimpse, but not the whole picture. Mm. And um, on this particular occasion, I don't know what what drove it but i said i want the whole picture and so i went for a <laughs> way too large a dose yeah. uh and the environment was all wrong um it, you know and i wasn't in the best uh you know emotional state at the time and i think all of those things sort of played together mm. um to create you know for me what was just absolutely hellish you mm. know in eight hours of of like just a, a terrible terrible experience um yeah. but like i said I, I i wouldn't take it back it taught me some incredibly profound things um that uh, will stick with me for the rest of my life and that factors into your art making because we initially started talking about the fantasy side of your art making mm -hmm. how does that factor into that how does that influence your, your creations um it's uh well i you know i I, I love just finding a way to sort of visualize that. And I see a lot of, I see a lot of artists that visualize it in a really literal sense, right. Where, where they are actually trying to replicate what um, their experience from some drug or whatever looked like, um, which is as far as I'm concerned, it's just not possible. You know, you just really can't replicate yeah. that um uh so what i'm trying to do is is replicate like how it made me feel um mm -hmm. and and sort of the conclusions that i was able to draw from that experience um and um you know because just a one to one of the visuals is not going to happen but but i can find some way to translate my um you know epiphanies i think mm. and and so that's what i'm trying to do i have a a, a series i would say of um <laughs> my friend calls them floral sapiens uh i'm not sure if i'm buying that name yet but uh it, it's not bad um 
but it's sort of the these people that are sprouting into uh flowers um and that is definitely coming from from that part of my my mind you know this sort of interconnectedness uh between all all life and that we are the same thing you know so um that's been a fun way to explore it um and you know beyond that just the <laughs> just the weird stuff that's going on inside of my head yeah. is making its way onto the canvas somehow oh, that's nice i mean it's, i like the fact that it's a response to the experience as opposed to as you said trying to emulate the experience in visual form which is there's always going to be a gap between mm -hmm. what internally and what you can express to someone who hasn't uh, felt those things um, yeah but yeah that's really interesting and i can see with certain things because i didn't know when i looked through your accounts i thought this is bordering on surrealism you know you're not too far away from like a surrealist approach like a salvador dali where it becomes mm -hmm. like a dreamlike experience in some but it's still in the fantasy realm but i thought you've got wiggle room to kind of express yourself in different ways there which is really nice and it's nice to see the freedom because i think we all box ourselves into a market when we become artists and uh, try to figure out what works with an audience what connects with them mm -hmm. that can be a, the wrong approach i think yeah it, well and i think uh, you know i feel lucky that portrait work is is what i kind of leaned into because that'll be there you know yeah. um people will want their portraits and I, and I, and I love painting portraits. It's, you know, for me, it's all about the process and I love the process. Mm. Um, but you know, with portraits, that'll be there. I'll continue to get my clients. It feels like it frees me up, mm. uh, on my creative side to explore different things and not have to box myself in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, even with very figurative stuff like portraiture, I feel like there's still a lot of room for, um, gleaning kind of insights that you hadn't noticed before or having epiphanies mid process of painting and it's just kind of going through and working things out and the push and pull of the painting process but mm -hmm. sometimes that can really reveal things where you think that's actually I've never done that before and yeah uh, try to think of an example if I can um well I mean just as a, a strange example I heard this isn't something that I came across but I heard that John Sargent, John Singer Sargent, does an S from the eyebrow down the nose and across the bottom of the nose. And he always has that. I mean, it's not a literal S, but it's kind of, he makes sure there's a shadow that is there and defined it. That, in. you know, it's funny that you say that because I can even see it, you know, yeah. like when I'm looking at you right now on your yeah. camera, I can see the S. Yeah. I love things uh, like that. Is there I, anything like that where you've kind of discovered things where you're like for a face i like this formula or i like to bring this out of portraiture and is there anything like that um yeah there you know there's been a few of them right i think a lot of them for me um have been in my color usage mm -hmm. uh you know like epiphanies that i've had in in using color uh that really work for me and uh, one one of them that stuck with me for a long time is that like <clears throat> you know skin is uh slightly translucent it's like reflect refracting that light inside of it and um <clears throat> so you know on on the thinner fleshy bits like the nose and the ears um you're gonna see on on the shadow side the light that is filtering through the skin and so uh i love to kind of push push that light it, it makes it feel a little more fleshy <laughs> which mm -hmm. is something that i enjoy um so you know if if i see some of that light i might make it a little brighter a little more red uh than it than it appears because it it kind of helps communicate that um it you know it it's a lot of little things like that uh mm -hmm. i've also found that like you know and it's something that i have to remind myself uh of but <clears throat> like softening the eyes seems to be something that that is really effective mm -hmm. uh and, and and i can't even quite figure out why you know but um i can have sharper detail on my other features but to to soften the eyes um and have like the eyelashes and the iris be less defined um and then bringing in just like a really sharp highlight on the eye just makes them feel so like full of life and organic. Yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, it, yeah, there's a lot of little things like I that. I love things like that. I absolutely love things like that. Because I think that's really important for other people to know. But it's so nice for you to discover and to kind of have that yeah. amount of knowledge build up. Yeah. And, and that's like, I, I mean, that's got to be my favorite part. I talked a little bit about loving the process of mm -hmm. painting, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that is it. I mean, it's a hundred percent why I do it. Right. I think if you don't love the process of painting, maybe painting shouldn't be the thing <laughs> that you're, <laughs> you know, um, I just, I love the process. I love those aha moments, you know, those epiphanies that I have when I'm working, it, it, it feels so like good to, finally understand why you're doing something, you know, yeah. um, and find something that really works. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, every painting is, is more or less an excuse to find more of those things, mm. you know, it's less about the final product and more about like what I can learn along the way. Yeah. It's truly seeing someone as well, isn't it? Cause you really do look at a person mm -hmm. and you're not just kind of deconstructing the form, but you're trying to bring out the humanity in the yep. picture as well, because otherwise it will just have this cold, I don't know, calculation to it that won't really translate as a true portrait. And you've got that lovely life in your painting. So I do love that. You've got Thank a great you. style to that. Um, Thank you. But it would be remiss of me not to talk to you about your recent explosion on social media. <laughs> I've been looking back and I'm, I'm shocked it's only recent because yeah, doing high quality work for a long time. And it seems like this one video of the cat portrait in side profile is the one mm. which blew up, wasn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about when that was and what happened? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I could tell you what happened. I mean, <laughs> I think it's just as much a shock for me as anybody else. Um, it happened, honestly, it, very recently, about a week and a half ago, I want to say. Mm. Um, you know, I've been posting on Instagram and Facebook, uh, and, you know, different socials for you know, at least a decade now. Mm. And um, the growth has always been slow. And so, you know, I really have been relying more on local things to keep this whole <laughs> operation going. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, I, I, I did that portrait of that cat and it just exploded. And I was in shock. And, you know, for like four days straight, I was just sitting there looking at my Instagram, wondering when it was going to slow down uh, <laughs> because it just felt like out of control almost, um, which I'm super grateful for. But I think a lot of artists could relate that it, it, it's almost frustrating, you mm -hmm. know, um, because it has been a decade of yeah. consist consistent posting. And, and I couldn't tell you what made that post specifically so special. You know, I, I, I don't know. It's, I wish I could identify it, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just went out of control mm. and every post. It? Sorry huh? I didn't mean to interrupt you. When did you notice that it was blowing up? Did you post it and then an hour or so later check and say, those are good numbers and then refresh it and it's, you know, increase. How, how, how did it hit you? It, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty immediate. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I posted it and I want to say, you know, once I post, I usually post something on Instagram and then I'll continue to scroll through a little bit and just kind of look for interesting stuff. Um, you know, and before I even had closed out the app, I noticed that it was, it was going fast, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I started responding to some comments and then I put it away and said, let me, let me not sit here and obsess about this. I'll just let it sit. And I want to say I checked it like three or four hours later yeah. and it, and it had already surpassed even my most successful posts I'd ever made. And, and um, <clears throat> yeah, it just, it just kept on going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it got to the point where you turned off notifications or are you just allowing your phone to ding constantly with, Oh, I, you know, I've got it. I've got <laughs> some, some stuff that kind of, only only notifies me of very specific stuff when it comes to Instagram I because I just can't I can't handle the <laughs> yeah. I I I already don't really like um the amount of time that I feel like I have to spend on my phone. Yeah. Um, you know, and and the last week, you know, it's been crazy because with the 
Um, I have, I have, I'm trying to think of like exactly how many followers I've gained in the last week. I mean, after 10 years of posting, I had just over a thousand followers. Hmm. And um, I imagine by the end of today, I'll be at 14,000. Um, and it doesn't, it's slowing, but it doesn't seem like it's stopping. So yeah. we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been crazy. The amount of people private messaging me and everything like that. And like I said earlier, you know, it, it is a little, it's a little frustrating because I feel like everybody on social media before they get their big break or whatever, you know, they're, they're, they want to know the formula. Yeah. Everybody wants to know the formula. And I always thought, you know, if I ever figure that out, I'll share it. I want yeah. people to know, like, I don't want, <laughs> um, but there's just no rhyme or reason to it. <laughs> bizarre, isn't it? But I mean, it, congratulations it on it because it's well-deserved. and it's Thank it's, you. See, uh, But I did notice that you were posting cat pictures back in 2021 and probably much earlier. And that's, you know, it just didn't, it just seemed to hit right with this one. And I'm yeah. glad because it meant that I came across you. Whereas otherwise, you know, there's so much stuff on Instagram. It's hard to find every artist you want to talk to. Oh, I mean, me too, because um, like you reaching out to me, I'm always looking for uh, good resources. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard of the podcast before you reached out to me. Mm -hmm. um, and when you did, I made sure to to take a day while I was working and listen to a few episodes. And it is I just love listening to uh, other, other artists talk about their experiences and their processes. So like having my eyes opened up to, to the podcast was, was really cool. And it's definitely something I'm going to keep listening to. So yeah. Yep. Well, Grateful you. for that. No, that's fantastic. I mean, it's getting harder on Instagram because uh, of obviously the amount of spam messages people receive. Oh, so now when I message people, I don't have a massive profile on Instagram either. I'm still, slowly but and i barely post on instagram it's mainly looking for guests now and messaging people and arranging dates for you know interviews like this or conversations like this and um and that's become a bit more of a problem because um people now want to message more to check that i'm not a bot you know even <laughs> i like to think that my account has been you know it shows that I make art and then it's been validated to an extent by certain high profile artists who are following me back after the interview. So I thought, surely if they're following my account, it shows I'm not a bot, you know, but then again, however much can be faked on mm -hmm. accounts, they will do that in order to try and create this false sense of um, validation, I suppose. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's crazy how convincing some of them can be. I mean, I know, <laughs> you and probably every other artist has gotten plenty of uh nft offers from <laughs> bots and um you know these people will you know these profiles will message me and if i can't tell at first i'll go to the profile and check it out and i'm shocked that some of these bots really do have you know they'll have a thousand or two thousand followers and yeah. they'll have a uh, post that look organic and um it's crazy how hard it is to tell yeah. uh, until they say, you know, <laughs> I'd like to buy your work as NFT. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm like, all right, <laughs> I know where this is going. I've had long conversations about before they mentioned NFTs because they just said they wanted to purchase the work. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Which pieces are you interested in? And they'll send me images and I'm thinking these are actually possible to do, you know, as far as to send off because I have them handy because not every piece yeah. of art I've made I have to hand. And then um, the conversation will go on for a while. And then I just think I should tell them, I say, you do know I don't sell NFTs. And then it's just no more conversation. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, there they go. <laughs> so, oh, man. And it's so like, uh, <laughs> I know Facebook has like the automated um, message if you're running a business page. Mm. And uh, it's so tempting to just put the automated message as like, I do not sell NFTs. <laughs> Probably save myself the headache. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a weird world. I don't uh, you know, sometimes I I, I wish <laughs> I it feels like now is probably the most opportune time to be an artist if you know how to navigate the online world. Um, but if you don't, it's just 
it can be really difficult. And, and sometimes I'm like, man, why couldn't I have been born 50 years earlier? You know, and yeah. I feel like this would have gone so much more smoothly yeah. um, if it was just solely brick and mortar, you know, but. Yeah. Well, you do. I mean, this reminds me as well, though, that you not only do the classical approach to painting, oil painting, but you also do, you know, high level drawing, some kind of illustration looking drawings as well, which looks like you work with ink as also. And then you've got digital uh, with the I'm thinking specifically of the SpongeBob, uh, <laughs> the, the creepy SpongeBob. So mm -hmm. you might adapt to different things. I mean, can you tell us about, you know, the you, that type of artwork as well? Is that is that a big part of your practice or is it just once in a while or uh it's you know the digital art is becoming a bigger part of my practice than i ever thought it would um mostly because it's a i mean the digital art is an incredible tool uh to have i don't it's not anything that i take as seriously you know uh to me having a, a physical artwork that i can hold in my hands when i'm done is it, it just feels important um, and it feels like it gives some weight to, to what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, being able to just work out pretty much any image I could possibly imagine with uh, no cost of materials and no mess. And mm -hmm. I could literally take it anywhere with me um, has been incredibly valuable. So, uh, you know, if I just want to doodle and I don't want to deal with the hassle of pulling out the paint, then digital is probably the way that I'll go. Or if I want to sort of plan out a more elaborate oil painting um, and I want to make sure that what I have in mind is actually going to work visually, then digital is a great way to go. Um, so I, I think that's more or less what I'm using the digital for, you know, it's more for play. Yeah. I think Um the and the sort of ink stuff i'd say that's a lot more new to me mm -hmm. um i've been i've been using oils for such a long time at this point you know and and really it's been my almost my sole focus um <clears throat> and uh i think just reminding yourself to to do different things every once in a while is important because it's so easy to like stagnate mm -hmm. um when you're just hyper focused on one thing and uh i find that when i'm when i pull out the charcoals or when i pull out the ink or you know whatever it is um at some point during that process i think about making visual art in a different way than i normally would mm -hmm. um so I love just playing around with that stuff to, to get my, to get my mind kind of operating on a different, in a, in a different way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my brother uses it for color composition. It looks to me like you're using procreate. Is that, is that what you use to do the digital stuff? Yeah. Yep. It's a, it's a great use. It's a, like you said, you know, a really efficient way of um, planning something out or to just play an experiment, like you said, but it's, it's it's a really nice way of of doing it and i appreciate the not every artist does that and i think some artists you know are purists about the physical stuff but i think some of the more you know youthful approach to artwork will use that but will still value using the physical materials because mm -hmm. there's such a gap between the two and yet they should be used as a tool so that you can as you said you know not waste uh, materials when you want to work something out either compositionally or just as an idea or just as play which can create a lot of um, just more inventive things I suppose than you yeah. can do as quickly physically yeah I mean that's exactly it right and and as far as I'm concerned I, you know use any tool that that you have available to you if it can help you improve in your work or help you have more fun with what you're doing mm. um then use it then i'm a big proponent of that use any tool at your disposal because um you know like i said the if I, if i just sat there and and only did oils then you know my whole art brain just becomes oil painting mm. and that's it um and and then i kind of restrain myself to that way of thinking and and uh the the moments where i have like the biggest leaps in the way that i approach art in general are the ones where i do something drastically different you know um and i want to make sure that like that's something i'm constantly doing mm -hmm. um 
Yeah. And, and, you know, especially with these kind of more outlandish fantasy pieces that I'm doing, um, you know, if you go back through my profile um, and look at my older works, I think I, I'm doing a lot more of those things now than I was, you know, five or 10 years ago. And I think a big part of that is because I have the freedom to play with those ideas like digitally on the iPad mm -hmm. um, to, to see if they're actually going to work mm -hmm. instead of just jumping into them headlong and, and, you know, with my fingers crossed hoping. Yeah. So, yeah. well, the video of this dog portrait you have behind you, beautiful portrait oh, you have there on the easel behind you. Thank you. And it's not just a demonstration. You're also kind of teaching the, the, thought process which you're using when you're doing it is teaching something which you have experience doing anyway do you teach people and is that something which you're you know actively doing uh yeah i um i've kind of taken a step back from like traditional teaching uh you know for i want to say i did about three years of um private lessons and group lessons specifically in oil paint or in portraiture mm. um you know, those two things. And um, I do love sharing it. You know, I, I, I think that's probably my, but, you know, my favorite thing about the art community that I have sort of entangled myself in is uh, just being able to like connect with somebody who has the same interest as you and just totally geek out about it. You yeah. know, I, I love that. And you can get something from them and they can get something from you. And like, that's super valuable to me. Um, and I think that is kind of why I, I stepped away from traditionally teaching a little bit um, because, you know, number one, I think a, a lot of the students um, don't quite know what they're getting into, you know? Um, and I think a lot of, especially here, I don't know if paint and sips are, are, are big uh, out in Europe, but in the States. I've heard the expression, yeah, but I don't, I don't know of it myself. So it's kind of like, um, you know, it's a big thing here. We'll, you'll go out to like a brewery or a bar or something like that. And, um, you know, you'll pay your little charge and you'll get a glass of wine or a beer and uh, an artist will sort of give you a step by step. Mm. Um, and then you leave with your own little painting. You can hang on the wall, but everybody's painting is identical. And, yeah. you know, um, and I think there's a lot of people... <laughs> that are sort of misled into thinking that that's sort of the experience that they're going to get. Um, and then, you know, when I'm running it a little more like a, you know, like a university course or something, they're kind of, you know, off put by that. Um, but uh, also just, you know, something not to, not to say anything bad about people who teach uh, and do it for a living because I 100% support that. And I think if you have useful information and you can make a living by sharing that information, 100%, you should do it. But, um, but for me personally, it's like, you know, I have fun sharing that information with people that enjoy it and uh, charging for it felt so strange and it kind of put a barrier between me and the fun mm. um and so you know that's why i think i've i've been doing more of this teaching on instagram and um different platforms like that because i, I just like to share it and mm. if i have information that's useful for somebody else and they can get something valuable out of it um like why i don't want to gatekeep that information i want to make sure like you know 10 years ago, if I would have wanted somebody to tell me it 10 years ago, then I, I want to tell people that now, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's funny how we're certain doors that we close on ourselves. Like, I mean, I completely understand the, the the kind of pure enjoyment of sharing something and not wanting to make it profitable because it seems to poison the well a little bit of the just true connection you can make with people and with the artwork is completely valid but it's kind of as artists how do we survive and stay afloat if we're kind of saying that feels a little bit too commercial and i had this conversation with a chap called andrew farmer yesterday who was uh, our guest and um and after we'd finished the podcast interview he, he and i stayed on the on the call for quite a while 
talking about different ideas and concepts and just the idea of selling art, he said, is something which he was distancing himself from. And he was making art that he thought wasn't commercially viable because he thought it's a pure expression of himself. And we were kind of talking about how do you how do you make yourself gainfully self-employed if you're saying this is no longer fit for a marketplace? You'd have to get funding from an art institution to fund your exhibition so that you don't have to sell artwork. And then again, there's a conflict there in the profit or the money being used to make art when you're truly just trying to express yourself. It's it's a strange business where we're such, well, a lot of us are such pure souls trying to just make the art and connect with the world. And yet if we don't make money, you can't keep doing that. Really. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I mean, it really is weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and sometimes I, you know, I don't know if you would share this sentiment or if a lot of other people would, but like sometimes I almost feel guilty about, um, you know, profiting off of it because mm -hmm. it just feels like that's not what art is truly about at its core, right? It's not, a, it's not about the profit. It's about the expression and having something to, to share with people and something to say. Um, but you're right. Like you have to, you have to, I, I think, um, you know, if a full-time artist had to, had to go get a nine to five uh, job in order to survive, then, you know, th I spent a lot of time uh, <laughs> in the workforce and uh, it just, it, it has this way of just killing your drive and your creativity. I think um, and even if you want to come home and draw and paint, it just, you know, it's not as available to you. Hmm. Uh, so you, you have to find a way. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that's unfortunate um, because, you know, in the perfect world, it would be great if artists could just make art and share it with the world and still feed themselves and keep a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it, you got to, you got to play it a little bit like a game and you got to find uh, your way to keep chugging along. And I, I love that guy's idea about, you know, moving away from selling art because he wants to make things that are not fit for a commercial space. Yeah. Um, I, I think that is just the, the coolest, <laughs> the coolest thing. Well, his episode will be up on Wednesday next week. So look forward to that. Oh yeah. Uh, I'll easy. check that out. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, it kind of segues quite nicely into what I wanted to talk to you about next, which is because you've had a, quite an interesting approach to materials and uh, brushes specifically you've mentioned to not necessarily have to invest in the most expensive uh, equipment for, you know, painting. So yeah. Can you explain for anyone who hasn't seen your Instagram posts on this, yeah. this might be a different audience than you're reaching already. Can you go through your thoughts and feelings on, on that type of approach? Yeah. Um, well, you know, so I, uh, I think it stems from having grown up in poverty, you know, um, that was my upbringing. Um, and uh, so we always made do with what we had. Um, and when I first started getting into art, it was the same deal. You know, uh, my, my parents are lovely and they have always supported me, but it couldn't always be the best of the best. So I had to make do with what I had. Um, and, you know, now I, I like to s stick by that. Um, because when, you know, I use a lot of like these old cruddy brushes. I talk about that in the Instagram uh, video. And initially that was just because that was what was available to me. But, you know, as it sort of evolved and I had access to better materials and, uh, you know, more professional ways of approaching stuff, you know, not every... Um, professional tool is going to give you the the outcome that you're looking for um and i find that with my sort of <laughs> brushes that are a little more rough around the edges um they're really great at, at just that right Ma making something that's more rough around the edges and and um you know i don't think that's something that you should dismiss just because it is not you know a respected tool 
Um, I I don't remember exactly what it is, but I read uh, Richard Schmidt uh, Richard Schmidt's um, All a Prima, mm. um, which is a if you if you're painting you know realism, uh, I highly recommend that book. It's incredible. It has some really good information in it. But he says something in there along the lines of like using any means necessary to make the effect that you're looking for. Um, and I just love that because, you know, the, the cruddy brushes give me um, a different look or dabbing something with a paper towel is going to give me a different look. And I've seen, um, I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with an artist named TJ Cunningham, but uh, he works out of uh, Vermont yes. and he, yeah. And he does these beautiful sheep paintings. Right. And um, he uses steel wool to, to apply the texture into the paint. And um, I just love that, you know, making art by any means necessary. And sometimes the, the cheap or sort of ugly tool is the one that just works better for that. Mm. And what about the paints themselves, the actual paint? Do you kind of invest in, you know, higher quality paints? Or are you happy with the lower branded or lower kind of priced paints? Uh, I would say, well, I guess that depends on what, what's considered higher quality paint. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I would, I would never buy, like, I think there's certainly a limit, right? Like if you get too cheap on paint, you're, I just find that you can't make anything that looks like anything, you know, uh, the, but past a certain point, you know, I think it's sort of, it's the same as guitars, right? So I play guitar as well. And if you're, if, if you buy like the cheapest of the cheap guitar, it's going to be worthless. Um, and then you get to a certain point where you can find a, a wide range of prices, but a similar value. Right. Yeah. And then you go beyond that. And that's when like your price is immense, but your quality starts to go back up again. And I find that it's sort of the same thing with paint, right? So paint is something that I am much more likely to invest the money in something that is, you know, a decent quality. Same with canvas. Um, you know, those are materials that I think they affect your painting in ways that, that uh, uh, are just a little more all encompassing and, um you know, it, I, the brushes, the steel wool, paper towels, whatever, the paint application can be done any way you want. Um, but I do think it's important to have decent paint and a decent surface to work on. No, sure. I agree. I, I'm kind of relieved you said that because I thought if you were saying cheap all the way through, I was going to push back and say, surely there is some constraints on the ability <laughs> to paint. paint. I've used cheap canvas and they're kind no, you, you're losing things with, you know, where you, you need to really try and present your work as well as possible. And the brushes and the paper towels and steel wool is absolutely an effect that can't be replicated without experimentation, which is really yep. nice. So I completely with you in that. Now, one thing that's important, and if you've listened to the podcast, as it sounds like you have, you'll know this is coming up, is what is your color palette? What colors do you use? Yeah, I... Uh... I'm really big on using a limited palette. Um, I use, I use uh, burnt umber, uh, alizarin crimson. Uh, I kind of change up my yellows, so I haven't settled on a yellow yet. Um, but uh, I think most often I use cad cad yellow light, um, and uh, ultramarine blue, and titanium white, and those are the only five colors that I typically use. Um, they. I'm sure there's a better combination out there that I <laughs> have not played with before. Um, but I really love using sort of a limited palette. I, I, I find uh, sort of counterintuitively that I have a much wider range when I'm using a limited palette um, than when I've got, you know, 16 different colors on my palette. I, I think I'm less likely to mix the specific color that I want if I have all of these colors to choose from. Mm. Um, and, and I also think using a limited palette teaches you how color works in a, in a really, um, you know, valuable way. Mm. Uh, but if you <laughs> sort of, my goal is like the purest 
primaries, right? Like that's, that's really what I want is the purest primaries to work from. And, uh, you know, if you have any information on a, on a really good primary yellow, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> well, I will relay that to it because Richard is an absolute, well, I'd call him an expert. I don't know if he'd uh, shy away from that, but he's so knowledgeable about the production of paints and the history of it and how it, so I will ask him about the truest uh, primary uh, yellow that you could use because I'm sure that he will uh, have some good feedback on that. I always like the idea of a limited palette will offer more color harmony as well throughout a painting. Whereas when you have a broader palette, there's a chance that you might have, I don't know, you'll, you'll have something which is slightly more incongruent with the rest of the yeah. actual mixes that you've been making. Well, so I think that's like, you know, I do feel like there's almost two different kinds of limited palettes, right? You have a, I think you can have a limited palette and also like a limited uh, range of color within that palette. Hmm. And then you can have my goal with my limited palette is usually have the least amount of paint and the widest range of colors that I can mix. Hmm. Um, but I really love, I love the work that I see where people are really limiting their color range and, you know, it's, it's, it gives it such a mood. And that is something that I've played with um, a lot more recently is kind of limiting what colors I allow myself to mix and what colors I allow into the final painting. Um, because if you, you know, if, if you just let any old <laughs> color into your painting, then it can, it can start to become a mess really quickly. So, um, but I do love that. So out of interest, between the CAD yellow light, what's the other yellow that you also use aside from that? Is there... Um, I want to say it's, uh, I want to say it's a Windsor. I don't know if another brand makes it. I have a Windsor Uten, uh, Hansa yellow that I really like. Um, and oh, man, I, I really wish I could think of the other one. There's one other yellow that I've played with and, and sort of it's, it's, it's really just that bouncing back and forth, looking for the perfect, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. primary yellow. I've played with other yellows. Uh, I know a lot of artists that love yellow ochre. Um, I can't, I can't understand that personally. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is just the muddiest yellow with like, you know, it, there's not a lot of range in that color. Um, but yeah, I, man, I'll have to get back to you if I can think of the other one. No, it's all right. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to know which ones you're experimenting with because just so that because I, I thought surely it's got to be somewhere in the range. Oh, give you. I, sorry, I just thought of um, Indian yellow is like one of my favorite colors ever. I love it. Um, I think I'm out of it now, but if I can implement it, I do. Mm. Um, and I don't know if you have any experience with that, but like it's it's such a it, it boggles my mind how Indian yellow works. Cause it's such, it's this really deep orange, like this deep vibrant orange right out of the tube. And then when you add white to it, it becomes the most vibrant yellow you've ever seen. And it's like magic. I really don't understand how it works. So that's another one that I really it is uh, love to it? use. It is. It doesn't make any sense to me, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Those are my favorite kind of colors. The ones that just like really blow your mind uh, oh, yeah. when you start to, experiment with them i have set colors that i use and it's a very limited palette uh, i paint mainly in acrylic you know but i mm -hmm. uh, but when i go outside of that you know limited palette and start experimenting with other colors one of which was the uh, yellow ochre and i really struggled i it was i mean i came out with a good plan air painting for the day which i'm quite happy with it rarely mm -hmm. happens it's only been a few times that's happened but i struggled and i used my art mentor and friend to help me and she came up and was saying right don't go for accuracy go for just tonal value now just to yeah. remove the accuracy of what you're trying to um describe on the on the surface and that really helped because I, I thought i can really get fairly accurate mixing with my limited palette and she said forget that just throw that out the window and just go for tonal value yeah yeah, so. yeah well and it, and it's tough to i'd love to hear a little bit about your experience uh with plein air painting mm. um because that's been one of the <laughs> most inconsistent uh, journeys for me is, is like working in, in plein air. Um, <laughs> it's, it's crazy how difficult it is to mix 
the right green, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and to kind of just deal with shifting light and everything. And uh, I'm curious if you don't mind my asking, like what, you know, what's, what's that been like for you, like going out and, and working in plein air and, I would say, I, like you said, I think I've had three successful plein air paintings out of, I'd say, nine or ten trips, you know. So um, sometimes I'll go out on a mission and it will take me so long to get to a location because I'm just almost on a recce, you know. I'm almost just trying to find what the spot is. Yep. And because I'm in North Wales, we've got a lot of mountains and hills and beautiful countryside and then if I come across some walkers and have a little chat with them about what I'm doing, they'll say, you tell you where you want to go. You want to take this path of that. And I start going on this mission following their directions and I'll get there early evening, soaking in sweat, starving. <laughs> and I'm just, I've set up my canvas and my camera to, cause I film everything. Mm -hmm. and I'm filming myself on top of a, a mountain and I'm saying, well, it's been a lovely day, completely lying to the camera. Yeah, you know, <laughs> great experience. And now we're going to do a quick painting. I'm just thinking it's got to be quick because I've got to just paint yep. this composition quickly. And it's come out and I've thought, I've got the composition, but the colours are too heavily saturated. I need to, to create those tertiary colours in order to have impact from the different uh, light quality. And that's something yeah. which I struggle with when I'm tired. Whereas other times I'll get lucky. I was once sat by a river in Chester and I was doing a reunion from some university students that I kept in touch with. So about five of them were showing up in, you know, an hour or so. So I thought I'll set up, I'll quickly paint something. And then when they start showing up, I'll get a few of them to sit in a spot and then I'll run to my car, chuck all my materials in and go back. And I thought, I'll, there's no way I'm going to do this because it's a river to bridge, loads of tourists because it was a sunny day. There's boats, mm. there's all kind of huts, and it came together. And it was one of the better, probably the best plan air painting I'd made. And I had people stopping talking to me, you know, lads be like, Oh, you're all right, mate. You know, and <laughs> all the lads, I was like, You're right, lads. They're like, Oh, I was buzzing. Oh, that's great. And I was like, All right, thanks very much. And then just crack it on, just trying to forget it and let it all pass you by. And it happened. Whereas I can have all the space and time in the world, which is more comfortable. And it just, it's a battle and it just doesn't happen. So, like yep. you said, it's very inconsistent at the moment. It, yeah, it's, it, I mean, I find that, you know, in my experience, it, it's the exact same way. Like, <clears throat> it's not like studio work. And I don't even know what the difference is. I guess when you're in the studio, you know, it's the same environment, mm -hmm. the same tools, the same conditions that you're working under every time. So, you know, maybe that has something to do with it. But my studio work, my progression seems to be a lot more linear. Mm -hmm. Um and it's easier to track. And with my plein air work, I just never know, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's going to turn out or not. And I have um, one painting, you know, every once in a while, I think <laughs> I'll do a painting and kind of be like, how in the world did I do that? You know, like <laughs> it, what, how did that come out of me? How do I do that again in the future? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I have this one painting, um, Oh man, I can't even remember what it's called. <laughs> it's good. It's I think it's called like uh um afternoon or early morning at Finnesy or something like that. Um it's a huge one. I never take big canvases out when I uh go plein air painting and I want to say this one was like 24 by 30 or or something like that or or it was panoramic so I'm sure it was a different size than that. Um but anyway, <laughs> Uh, a big, a big canvas. And I went out there and I spent five hours out there, which I normally would never do plein air painting because the light is completely different once, yeah. you know, five hours has gone by. Um, but somehow I just pulled out like my favorite landscape plein air or in the studio doesn't matter. Like my favorite landscape I've ever painted came out of that. Nice and, uh, and I don't know how <laughs> <laughs> is that on your Instagram? Cause I'll try and find that and show it. Yeah. And you know, I really wish I could remember the exact title. I don't titles are so weird to me. Yeah. Um, cause like giving a painting a title <laughs> just feels strange anyway. Yeah. Like to me, I feel, you know, you're so intimately familiar with your own work that like uh, it, to name it seems strange. Um, it almost takes something away, doesn't it? Cause you're giving yeah. it. Yeah. 
language whereas it should speak for itself almost you know yeah exactly and it, it you know especially with my like sort of like i said that the outlandish fantasy stuff i i really hate naming that stuff because um because it, it, it yeah it feels like it sort of narrows the scope yeah um <laughs> but uh yeah so you know i just throw out a random name and then hopefully it sounds halfway decent and then apparently i forget it uh within yeah. a matter of a couple months <laughs> well do you i mean do you exhibit your work because you have to title things when you exhibit in galleries is it yeah exhibited in galleries yeah 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 um <clears throat> it you know lately it's uh it's been more like uh, you know exhibitions that are lasting like a weekend or a day or something i definitely i used to have some reliable galleries that i would hang stuff in and it would you know stay there for months or a year or whatever um and that's definitely something that i want to come back around to because it's just been so long since i've had work in a gallery you know to stay for a while mm. um <clears throat> but galleries are a weird thing to navigate as well you know um <laughs> and uh yeah. yeah and and I, and I think one of the things i didn't realize early on in my career um is that like you know it's not all about the gallery picking you right you got to pick your gallery too yeah uh it, and and that's tough um to to find a gallery that you feel like your work really flows with and uh, you know a gallery that's showing the stuff that you'd like to your work to be seen alongside and a gallery that is going to operate in a way that feels friendly to you as an artist and and um <clears throat> and one that has like a price point that you fit into yeah. you know um so that's uh that's always an interesting <laughs> journey um <laughs> but lately lots of like i said you know quick exhibitions um you know that last a weekend or a week or something like that um <clears throat> and those are fun um so this episode will be going up a week on wednesday now i okay. wish I knew the dates but i don't have a calendar in front of me to say this date but it's basically i think it'll be uh so wednesday is going to be the 31st of january so a week on wednesday will be what the 6th of february i think i think that is oh no it won't be it'll be the 7th of february um mm -hmm. quickly uh, doing the maths in my head so the 7th of february will be when your this episode goes up okay will, if, if anyone wants to see your work in person because it's going to be an international audience where in the states are you for your work to be seen where are you exhibiting in case anyone at that time will it be in a gallery where you know it'll be there on the 7th of february uh on the 7th of february shoot there's so many like little things going on it's hard to say um i don't know that there's going to be anything up specifically on the 7th of february so i know that um uh right around then i always i do a lot of live painting so if you're in the uh augusta georgia area you can definitely catch me live painting i know um i'll be doing quite a few of those uh <clears throat> early in February um, there's an event called the wet paint party um, in March that I'll be exhibiting in. Um, and unfortunately I typically have a solo show in March as well. Um, but that space was recently accommodated by a different business. So that one's not going to fly. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're in the Augusta, Georgia area specifically, <laughs> there, there are definitely lots of events going on that you can catch me at. I'm usually, if there is an art related event in the city, you'll probably find me uh, painting live there. And um, you know, like I said, the wet paint party and everything like that. Um but uh yeah <laughs> i know solid galleries as well where you can sort of say this gallery and this gallery i work with periodically to check in those guys or they sell work through that gallery is there anything like that uh you know not at the moment no and it's unfortunate because like i said the 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 space where i usually do my solo shows is sort of the gallery that i was working with mm. um and and that space got taken over by a different 
entity now. So um, at the moment, I don't have any um, like solid <laughs> brick and mortar galleries where you can definitely go see my stuff. Mm. Um, but that will be changing soon enough. I'm definitely on the hunt for more uh, galleries where things can go up to stay for a while. That'll be announced on Instagram. And do you have a website? So where should people find you online? Because you sell through, is it through Instagram or do you sell on your website or? Uh, you know, if somebody wants to commission me um, for a piece, we can definitely talk about that over Instagram. I, I do do a lot of those uh, conversations through <laughs> Messenger uh, or on the Instagram Messenger. Um, I also have a website. It's uh, foltzstudio.com. It's F-O-L-T-Z studio.com um and that's a good place to kind of check out my work and and see what's going on and and um i have a print store there as well if anybody uh you know is a fan of the work and they want a more affordable al alternative uh there's a print store there um but you can also commission me through my website no, fantastic. And uh, I've heard that you don't sell NFTs, so don't be... I don't. don't. <laughs> and then all the links for what you said is it be in the description of the video, because uh, I really want to uh, help you uh, drive the audience towards helping and supporting and viewing your work, because you're Thank you. a fantastic artist, a, a fantastic guest as well, a lovely person to talk to. I really appreciate you coming on. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>